Hello, everyone. So it's a pleasure to meet and introduce our, our next talk, which will be given by Professor Crescendo Chakabarti uh, from the University of Duke. Uh, Professor Chakabarti is the John Cock Distinguished Professor and Department Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and also Professor of the Computer Science at Duke University. He was visiting professor in several universities around the world, like University of Tokyo, Japan, University of Bremen, Germany, Tsinghua University in China, National Tsinghua University in uh, Taiwan, and National Chenko University Taiwan. And he also received a lot of awards during his career, uh, most notably the NSF Career Award, Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, Humble Research Award, IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award, IEEE Circuits and Systems Society Charles Desor Technical Achievement Award, Semiconductor Research Corporation Technical Excellence Award, and also Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Invitational Fellowship in the short term S Nobel Prize level, which means uh, a fellowship that award researchers that do contributions at Nobel Prize level. And his research interests are designed for testability of integrated circuits and systems, especially 2D integration on, and system on chip, microfluidic biochips, hardware security, machine learning for e-health, AI accelerated and neuromorphic computing systems. He's also fellow of ACM, IEEE, AAAS, and a Golden Core member of the IEEE Computer Society. The title of the uh, talk is Functional Criticality Classification of Structural Faults in AI Acceleration. So thank again for your speech, Professor Chakabarti. You have the floor. OK, thanks a lot, Ricardo, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk at this forum. Um, this morning, I will talk about uh, AI accelerators and specifically on uh, the criticality of faults in AI accelerators. Um, so let me get started. Uh, first, acknowledge my PhD students who are working on this research, Arjun Jodhari and John T. Talukdar, and Faye Su at Intel, my former student, but now he is a mentor on this research, uh, sponsored by the Semiconductor Research Corporation, and we collaborate very closely with Intel, uh, TI, IBM, and Mentor Graphics on this research. If you are interested to learn more about this work after my presentation, here is a paper uh, that was published recently at ITC. If you are not able to get hold of this paper, please feel free to contact me. So let me get started um, with the outline. Um, so I will first uh, walk you through some motivation. Uh, why are we interested in functional criticality analysis? The idea is that not all faults are equally bad. Some faults are benign, others are catastrophic, and we would like to do a quick analysis to figure out which are the catastrophic faults. As an experimental vehicle in this research, we are using a systolic array-based AI accelerators. This is typically used by various companies right now. I'll walk you through some of the hardware design and how do we map a deep neural network onto this architecture, onto this array. Uh, a quick look at automated fault injection framework. Um, most of the talk will be on the analysis, so pin-level fault criticality analysis, looking at processing elements and what happens to the faults at the pin level. Uh, look at a lot of st uh, statistical correlation issues. And then we have a method based on machine learning that is able to predict or categorize faults in terms of their criticality. So think about this as machine learning for machine learning because the accelerators are used for machine learning. And we are using in a virtuous cycle um, machine learning to understand the criticality of faults in, this, in these architectures. So let's think of an application scenario. So we have an AI accelerator, as shown here, uh, which is used for inferencing uh, for various image processing, classification, uh, self-driving uh, applications of that type. And we have a large amount of data, so usually images. It could also be text, could be audio, could be uh, other kinds of things, and pre-trained models. So these are deep neural networks, convolutional neural networks, which have already been trained, for example, in the cloud. Uh, these are now being mapped to the accelerator uh, so that you can do uh, inferencing on the edge on these accelerators themselves. You do not need to send everything to the cloud for doing inferencing. 
Uh, and the outcome would be some classification. So did you see an airplane, automobile, cat, dog, and so on? So this is the application scenario we are looking at here in this work. And the systolic array is being um, advocated as a very efficient architecture for such accelerators uh, because they are very energy efficient. Uh, they have very regular structure. And for a lot of the matrix uh, vector uh, multiplication, also called MAC, uh, multiply accumulate units, uh, these architectures are extremely uh, efficient. So motivation is that uh, neural networks, like the deep neural networks we are looking here, are inherently fault tolerant. So a lot of the faults that may appear do not impact the accuracy of inferencing. But the fault tolerance depends on the application. So we need to know for a given application, uh, what are the most important faults? So functional criticality of a fault is determined by its impact on the accuracy, on the functional performance. For inferencing, it is whether you are misclassifying uh, a dog as a cat. So as long as your classification is correct, uh, the fault is benign. Now, when we talk about uh, how do you test uh, these kind of AI chips, so these chips are being made by many companies right now. Uh, for example, NVIDIA has uh, special purpose uh, uh, domain customized accelerators. If you target all the faults, it's an overkill because you may throw away a chip which uh, fails certain tests, but those faults are not important. So if we can selectively test nodes that uh, are going to impact our accuracy um, based on criticality analysis, then we can improve the yield of these chips. Now, we could do a fault simulation. Um, so essentially, we could inject faults into the actual hardware, and we could look at the impact. Uh, and that is, in some sense, what we are doing here, but we are do doing it in a very smart way. So instead of doing a brute force simulation where you inject every fault one by one and then you evaluate that uh, for all the possible inputs, so this will take a lot of time. Our estimate is it can take years of CPU time, even on a very fast CPU. So we're looking at fault severity classification, and the application is going to be in field testing. So if you have uh, periodic testing in the field using, for example, built-in self-test or DFT, what kind of testability to add to these chips, uh, it also to build robust hardware. So if you want to build hardware that is robust, you would know which parts of the hardware are more important, uh, and you would robustify that part of the hardware. So uh, fault criticality analysis can be a guide. It can guide us through test grading and quality assessment. So if you look at this picture here, we have a target architecture. Let me get a pointer here um, so we can it'll be easier for me to uh, walk you through. So I, I hope you can see my pointer. So this is the target hardware, for example, systolic array. And then we have a catalog of use cases. These are different. DNN trained for various applications. Uh, so you can call them DNN1, DNN2, DNN3, and so on. And then you have a flow where you take the target hardware and you take a specific DNN, and then you do this criticality assessment. And the outcome is a, a basically a bunch of domain-specific fault criticality. So this is a catalog or a library, which a user or a bunch of users can use for their applications. So the customer requirements would therefore uh, be for targeted testing, either test generation, built-in self-test, test point insertion. So we can use this flow to target several use cases uh, given by these various uh, DNNs, one through four, which are mapped to the same underlying hardware architecture. Okay, so this is the, the real uh, interesting application of this work. Um, so the objectives, therefore, we start with an accelerator, as shown here, which is implemented using a systolic array. Uh, and essentially, this is how the systolic array looks. And we will look at this more in detail a little later. You have an array of identical elements. Each one is called a processing element, or PE. And uh, let me move out the pointer here. So we basically can have a structural fault, uh, which could be inside a PE or on some uh, IOs or some interconnects in the array. And we would like to know um, whether these uh, fault effects are correlated. So for example, the impact of a fault in PE1, is it the same as in PE2 or PE3? Uh, so this is called the correlation part and transferability. So the criticality assessment that we are doing for a given PE, can the same assessment and the same result does it map to another PE? 
Okay, so that's that's what we are trying to do here. So prior work, uh, this is a very active research area. In the past few years, there have been many papers to understand the criticality of faults. Um, so papers one and two shown here, they are looking at fault tolerance of DNNs. And they basically show that DNNs are robust to certain types of structural faults and soft errors, but they are agnostic of the actual architecture. So they're looking more at the DNN itself, uh, but not in terms of what is the architecture on which it is mapped. Uh, more recent papers, three and four here, they study the fault tolerance of systolic array-based accelerators. So these are more architecture specific, uh, but their uh, analysis is limited to the pin level. So the PE inputs outputs, not what is going on inside the PE. And then a more recent paper, uh, reference five, uh, it looks at functional testing, similar to what we are looking at, but again, it is not looking at hardware reuse. If you are trying to map a DNN to an underlying hardware, you would be reusing the same PE in multiple passes uh, through the inferencing. So that was overlooked. And also the criticality was assessed using randomly selected structural faults. Um, there are lots and lots of faults. These are very large circuits. So if you do random sampling, you will miss many faults. Okay. So what, what is the, the open problem that I'm trying to address today in this presentation is that uh, we are trying to do functional fault criticality analysis of structural faults or all the structural faults in, inside a PE. So this is a, a systolic array that is currently in the market. You can buy this. This is Google TPU, and there are different versions of the TPU, uh, 1.0, 2.0. There's also 3.0. Um, so this is a neural-specific architecture that uh, emphasizes the matrix multiplication operation. It provides very high throughput and compute density, uh, simplifies control. It's a very regular structure, and it does very efficient convolution. So the key part here, the largest part of the chip, even though the block diagram uh, does not indicate the relative sizes, but this matrix multiply unit is a very large array of processing elements. And this is the core of any inferencing engine. So how does data flow through the systolic array? So as I told you before, it's a 2D array of identical elements. Each of this is called a processing element or PE. Uh, so think of this as an N by N array. And inputs uh, come from the left, so X sub R. This is the data that is shared by all the rows in the array. So X1 goes to each uh, PE in the same row, uh, first row. X2 goes to all the PEs in row two, and so on. And then from the top, we have basically the weights uh, that are being sent in. So W1 through W4, think of these as vectors. Uh, these are uh, being fed down the column. So everything uh, here, W1 goes to each of the PEs in the same column. Okay, And then the column basically computes what's called a rolling dot product of uh, this vector here, uh, x1 through xn, and the weight vector, which is given by this, uh, this element here. And the columns operate independently of each other. Okay, so, uh, And then the, the, at the bottom, we get the accumulated sum. So s41 is basically the accumulated sum of the first column and, and so on. So let's now uh, zoom in to the PE, which is the core of this uh, architecture. So every PE essentially has an adder and a multiplier because it does the multiplication and acc accumulation uh, operations. Could be 32-bit, could be 16-bit. Uh, in a very low cost uh, on the edge device, could also be 8 bits. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the top PE. This is the PE which is adjacent to the one we are looking at. So this is the PE we are looking at right now. And then there's one on the left, one on the right, one on the top, and one at the bottom. Inside each PE, we have a partial sum register and a weight register. And then we have a multiplier and we have an adder. Okay. Um, so the PE basically multiplies the input activation, which is XR, uh, with the weight, which is this one here, and then adds this product to the accumulated sum, okay? So the, this product gets added to this sum, and then it is uh, passed to the, uh, it's basically passed on. So we have the weight register, so it goes down uh, through here. It also goes to uh, the, the input, x goes to the right, and the accumulated sum goes, goes to the bottom. So this is the overall architectural view, and you need to understand this to evaluate fault criticality, because if you're looking at fault criticality, you have to know how the data is transferred through the array. And if you have a fault in a certain PE, the flow of data would tell you how this fault affects other PEs in the array. 
Okay, so this is a, an example of a DNN, and we, I took this one because it's simple uh, to explain, but there are many other DNNs you can look at. There's a whole bunch of uh, ResNet and VGG16 and AlexNet and so on, but this is a smaller one called Linet5. Um, it has uh, convolutional layers, it has uh, fully connected layers, uh, and it basically does image recognition. So this is a benchmark that many of you might have seen or used. This is called MNIST, a bunch of characters for recognition. And uh, this DNN basically is going to re recognize uh, characters from this set. Uh, it uses the ReLU function. This is a nonlinear activation function. And uh, just to uh, get a quick look at the size of this deep neural network, um, the number of parameters or weights for each layer is shown here, how many MAC operations you are doing for each layer. And finally, there's something called a filter uh, for um, uh, analyzing the images and feeding them to the network. And these are the sizes of the filters. Okay, so if you can build a similar table for uh, some uh, some other kinds of DNNs as well. So now we are going to map the uh, input data or the input matrix to this array. And there are two kinds of mappings. We have to map the 3D convolution layers and we have to map the, the, the fully connected layers. So on the top, you are seeing the mapping of the 3D convolution layer. So essentially, we will do some unrolling of the columns. And uh, basically, those are going to be mapped like this from the top. And then the weight matrix is unrolled in each row. And that is going in uh, through these rows here. Okay, So I will not get into all these details, because this is not really that novel. I mean, this is pretty common. Most people who are looking at building hardware accelerators will have to do this anyway. Um, and then for the fully connected layers, uh, this is an example of a, of a fully connected layer. Um, you would unroll the weight map matrix like this, and you would basically load it as shown in this picture. Okay. But what, what is interesting is we will now start to look at faults and fault injection. Our goal is to uh, evaluate the criticality of faults, so we have to inject the fault. So once we map the DNN to the underlying systolic array, we will start doing fault injection. And we're looking at two kinds of fault injection, uh, pin level and gate level. So pin level is on the boundary of the PE, and gate level is inside the PE. For pin level, we don't need to know what is the structure of the PE. So it could be Python code, much simpler. It's looking at just the behavior. Uh, and the goal is to evaluate the pin level criticality of all the buses inside the PE, because those have external visibility. Um, for gate level fault injection, we are looking at very log code because we have to look at the synthesized netlist for the PE. And we're looking at all the internal faults. And the fault models could be stuck at opens, shorts, and so on. We could look at timing faults as well. So the overall flow would be some, something like this. Uh, this is a two level fault injection. So first, we do the Python level injection, the behavioral model, uh, pin level fault injection. Um, we identify the pin level critical faults, um, and then we start to go inside the PE. We traverse the netlist. Uh, we do some fan-in analysis. We identify the, the um, internal critical faults. We inject faults using a very log HDL uh, model. Uh, we can inject different kinds of faults as shown here. Uh, we have a uh, synthesized wet list that is utilized for fault injection. Uh, we do some post-simulation processing, and then we have uh, a list of all the internal critical faults. Okay. And uh, the overall gate level fault injection methodology can be described as shown in this slide. So this is the gate level uh, PE net list. We have some parsers to basically go through the net list. And we have scripts that would inject uh, different kinds of faults. So we have a faulty gate level in, 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 in net list. So this is the first step. Um, we have a fault injection dictionary that allows us to systematically inject the faults. In step two, we have a faulty gate level net list. We do some fault simulation using Winopsis VCS. And that is done by taking advantage of the, the network. So the CNN or the DNN that we are working with, systolic array, we have the mapping done. We have the pre-trained weights, and we have the testing images. Because we are looking at functional inputs, not test inputs, not like any regular input. So therefore, uh, we have to look at all the input images uh, and do fault injection based on that. Uh, in step three, we are looking at the simulation log parser, and the output of that would be 
the accuracy for each fault. For each, for each injected fault, we want to know what is the impact on the classification accuracy. And if it is below a certain threshold, then we would say that this is a critical fault. So now I get into the next topic, which is spin level fault criticality analysis. So I showed you this picture of a PE before, uh, and this is what is inside the PE. So we have uh, bus A, bus B, uh, bus C, and bus D, and our goal is to inject faults in these four buses. A and B are inputs to the multiplier. Uh, C is the input to the accumulation unit, and D is the multiplier output. And the array is a bunch of columns like this. So the way we are numbering the PEs is shown here. So uh, this is PE0, PE1 in each column. And we have multiple columns as shown here. So pin level fault simulations uh, we do for 32-bit PEs and 16-bit PEs. And the total number of faults that we have, these are uh, st st stuck at faults inside each PE is shown here, 256 uh, for 32-bit PE and 128 for 16-bit PE. And then we set a criticality threshold. So based on the training accuracy we have for the input data, we would say that if our accuracy level with the fault drops below 95%, then the fault is critical. If the accuracy for the 100 images stays above 95%, then we would say this is a benign fault. It does not impact the target application. Now, when we did this fault injection experiments, uh, we were quite surprised to find that for most of the injected faults, the accuracy was very high. So these are histograms that talk about, that show you how much is the accuracy for each fault. So uh, this is the x-axis is the classification accuracy. So from the very low accuracy, zero, all the way up to 100%. And each of these graphs is for us a given PE. So this is a 16-bit PE in row one, column zero. This is 16-bit PE, row 50, column zero. This is a 32-bit PE, row 50, column zero. For each of these PEs, irrespective of whether it's 32-bit or 16-bit, we found that most of the faults give you very high accuracy. So the, the classification accuracy remains close to 100% for a large percentage or the overwhelming number of faults inside the PE. There are only a small number of faults that impact the accuracy. Okay, now, this is consistent with the, the previous findings that show that these uh, circuits are extremely fault tolerant. So let's now zoom in a little bit more to understand these results to figure out which faults are benign and which faults are critical. So here we are looking at the, the buses A, D, and so on, and we're looking at mantissa bits versus exponent bits versus the sine bits. So if you look at the accuracy impact, for the mantissa bits, the accuracy remains high. If you inject a, st a, a stuck at fault on a mantissa, a bit, it does not have any impact on the accuracy. It remains almost 100%. Um, on the other hand, for certain exponent bits and sine bits, the accuracy can drop. Okay, so and this was also an interesting finding. And uh, so now I will go through the key observations. So uh, when we say a fault is benign, if the classification accuracy is more than 95%, most faults in the Mentissa bit for all the four buses, A, B, C, and D are benign faults. Also, the faults in the sine bits for buses A, B, and D are benign. And the faults in the exponent bits for buses A and B are benign. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have criticality uh, when the accuracy is less than 95%. And that occurs for faults in the exponent bits for buses C and D and faults in the sine bit for bus C. So we can now precisely say which faults are more important for the inferencing. So why is this the case? So we have results empirically obtained through experiments, but we should also be able to explain that maybe with some theory, with some an analysis. Um, so we are trying to do that here on this slide. So let's say we are looking at the multiplier inputs. Uh, buses are A and B. Uh, so the input A carries a weight W, and the input B carries activation X. And let's suppose we have some faults that causes an error. So we have a, an error of delta W in the weight and delta X in the, in the activation. So the weights are usually very small. And, and I will show you a slide very soon, which basically tells you that most of the weights are around zero, very small magnitude. Therefore, the change in the weight is also very small. So W is small, so delta W is small. Therefore, X times delta W is also small. 
Um, and because W is small, W times delta X is also small. So the, 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 um, the actual error which you will get, which is the sum of the two of these parameters will also be small. Now, if you look at the, accum the accumulation bus C, this bus has critical faults because the value on this bus accumulates across several P's. So the, 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 the errors can actually add up. And that is the in intuition why um, the faults on this bus tend to be more critical. Uh, bus D is the multiplier output, and uh, it's basically X times W. And if you have a, an, a fault which changes this value, so let's call it delta of this, you can express it in this fashion. And as we saw, saw earlier here, this product is small and this product is very small. So the sum is also very small. Therefore, um, the impact is also very small. And the mentissa faults are benign uh, because the fault free ment exponent is not big enough to amplify the errors in mentissa pins. So that for in a floating point calculation, you are going to be multiplying the mentissa value with the exponent. And if the exp exponent is small, then any change in the mentissa will also be small. So now let's look at the weight values. So this is looking at the, the weight values for a given PE. This is a row 24, column 0, and the fault-free distributions. You can see that most of the weights are 0, and there is a small spread around 0, but the magnitudes are still very small, 0.15 or minus 0.15. It doesn't go much larger than that. So the largest absolute weight is less than 0.2. So any error due to a fault in the weight bus, A or B, is also small. Fault-free weight values are small. Therefore, when you multiply this um, with the, uh, with the um, uh, inputs, uh, the values are also very small. Okay, And this is shown for 1,298 passes to the network. To do inferencing on Linet on a, a, a 128 by 128 PE array, you need to have 1,298 passes through this uh, PE array. Uh, this basically shows you the uh, uh, the activation values that are, are received by this PE. And you can see that they also tend to be very small. Most of them are zeros. And then you have a small number that are a, a bit more than zero, but the number of large values is also very, very small. So the ReLU basically filters out the negative activations. Therefore, you don't see any negative values here. And the error due to fault in activation bus A or B is small. So therefore, uh, when you multiply the errors with small weight value, they're also very small. So this gives you a little bit more explanation on why we have um, such a small number of uh, critical faults. We can do the same thing for the multiplier. On the multiplier, again, the weight distribution is similar, uh, mostly 0. And a few weights are around 0, but their magnitudes are quite small. Um, and then you can look at the partial sum distribution. Uh, this is what uh, is produced by the by the PE on the output side, and it goes to the next PE. And even here, you can see the values are mostly zero. Uh, in each pass, you will find most of the um, the partial sum values are actually zero. And because of this, we can argue and basically have some kind of a justification that um, you have uh, a lot of faults are benign in the multiplier as well. OK, so that uh, is about some, some of the uh, experimental results on pin level criticality. And I'd like to now walk you through how we can use these results uh, to come up with some theorems that can help us to make a more um, you know, broader conclusions. So the first theorem basically talks about um, a processing element PE, which has a bunch of nodes on the output, and that set is S. Uh, and let A be a scenario where we can have um, multiple stuck at zero faults, like these two uh, stuck at zero faults are benign, and then these two stuck at one faults are benign. So we can actually combine these and say that any combination of stuck at zero or stuck at one faults on these uh, nodes will also be benign. Okay, So this helps us to expand the set of benign faults and critical faults. So we can do single fault injection and identify the individual benign faults stuck at 0 and stuck at 1. And then we can use this theorem to expand the set of benign faults by saying that all combinations of faults uh, from the set can are, are benign as well. Uh, theorem 2 is sort of more intuitive. It is easier to prove. It's also quite obvious is that I can look at the fan cone of a node and make some more 
conclusions on the internal fault. So suppose I have a stuckat fault here, which is benign, and a stuckat fault here that is benign. So if I now go and trace back, look at the fan-in cone, and if the nodes in the fan-in cone can only propagate to these given nodes, uh, then those uh, internal faults must be benign as well. So this helps us to, again, expand the set of benign faults which, which we have. So let's now look at a statistical correlation because our goal is not to analyze every PE, right? Because that takes a long time because there are so many PEs inside the array. So the question is, can I analyze one PE and can I extrapolate the results on fault criticality based on this PE to, to some other PEs? So he, here we're looking at a, a statistical metric, so standard deviation or sigma in classification accuracy for pin level faults, okay? So we looked at uh, a large number of PEs uh, to evaluate this correlation. And we did a bias-free sampling strategy. So we selected uh, PEs from the rows which are well separated out in different in the same column. And we also did the same thing for uh, picking the columns. And essentially, a low value of sigma means there is low uh, standard deviation or very high correlation. So if the uh, sigma of fault criticality between two different PEs is low, then it means that the set of benign faults have very high correlation. Okay, so this would al allow us to conclude that fault criticality transfers well uh, across the array. So let's look at the results here. So we have a 32 bit PE shown in the first two graphs here, stuck at zero faults and stuck at one faults. And we are calculating the standard deviation across all the PEs. Um, and what you see here is that we have uh, the mentissa part is in green, exponent part is in pink, and the sine part is in, is in yellow. So in green, you see the standard deviation is zero. It's zero here, it's zero there, it's zero here, zero there. And what it means is that the benign faults in the mentissa transfer very well. So if I can show that a bunch of mentissa faults are benign in PE1, then they are likely to be benign in every other PE. Okay, so that's what this result shows. Now, for the pink and the yellow, we don't have such low standard deviation, they're a bit higher because these faults tend to be uh, more critical. So therefore, we expect that they will not have this high correlation level because this correlation is in terms of the inferencing accuracy. If the inferencing accuracy impact is very low, then we're getting the same high accuracy for all the benign faults. But if the fault is critical, then the accuracy impact can be 10%, can be 50%, can be 70%. Therefore, we don't expect to see very high, uh, we don't expect to see low standard deviation if the faults are critical. So therefore, these uh, plots here are, are expected, okay? But it does give us some preliminary insights into the transferability. So that's what we, I, I'm gonna show, show next. So basically I look at all the pin level faults inside a PE, which is my set B. This is the larger set of all the pin level faults. And then I have a subset of these faults. I'm calling them B correlated. These are the benign faults that are highly correlated across all the PEs, okay? So the question is, what percentage of the benign faults in a PE are also benign in all, all the other PEs, okay? So we can analyze this in terms of conditional probability. So let's say there's an event E1. E1 is an event that says that if I select a fault B, if I randomly pick a fault B, uh, this is picked from the set B. Uh, I'm sorry, fault F. I'm randomly picking a fault F, uh, and this fault is from the set B. This is my event E1. And the event E2 is saying that if I select a fault F, then this fault belongs to the subset B correlated. So my goal is to calculate the pro conditional probability that if e, E1 occurs, then what is the likelihood of E2 occurring? Which means that if I select a fault that is benign, what is the probability that this fault also is correlated across multiple Ps? And you can use very simple probability laws to calculate this expression. And in the end, you get something like this, okay? And this you can experimentally plot because we know what these probabilities are based on our experimental results. So, so we did that, and now you will see here um, these this uh, ratio um, between for various Ps, and if this ratio is very high, then we get very high transferability. So, if this ratio is close to one, it means that the benign faults in one P are also benign everywhere else. 
And you can see that in many cases, this is almost one uh, or more than 0.9. And the minimum value is still almost 0.9. Right, so we're getting very high values of these uh, of these ratios. So this provides uh, insights into the fact that benign faults correlate very well. Okay, so we do not have to analyze the p's individually. We can obtain results for one p, and we can transfer that result across multiple p's. Okay, so that's about the pin level uh, analysis. Now we will look inside the p. And here we'll be using machine learning. So what we are going to do is we will generate um, uh, two kinds of features. Uh, we have features based on topology, which is the necklace, looking at the gates that make up the PE and, and the connectivity and the type of gates and so on. And then we have features based on data. And these are features that are uh, based on the transfer of information throughout the array. So how is the... Uh, data transferred from P to P. Okay, so this are the, these are the features that are used for training. So we will train a machine learning model, and then uh, we would uh, provide to the model um, some information ab about um, some other uh, faults, um, and we would make a classification on whether the fault is uh, critical or benign. Okay, so this is this is being done because we cannot individually simulate every internal fault. This would take us a long time to do. Therefore, we want to speed up the process, take a small subset of faults, extract their features, train the model. And then for every uh, other fault, we'd be using this uh, train model to do inferencing on whether the fault is critical or benign. So what are the features? Well, the first kind of features are uh, topological features, which are um, based on things like the depth of a node from a primary input, depth of a node from a primary output, um, number of critical pins in a fan out cone, the primary uh, inputs in the fan in cone, uh, and so on, right? So this is based on the uh, 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 structure. Uh, these are the topological features. And then we have data features, which is looking at the flow of bits through the array. Uh, through the rows and columns. So here you have basically the bit streams across each simulation simulation cycle. And here you have images from the inferencing data set. So we'll be creating simple uh, a, a score based on this information. So uh, what we do is we are doing compression along the x-axis first. And then we'll be, uh, um, be looking at the average bit stream per node across all the images. So instead of having a separate value for each image, we take the average value across all the images. And then we look also at the y-axis here, and we do a weighted compression, which is based on, 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 on uh, the uh, values at every point in time. Okay, So we therefore now are creating features based on the topology and the data flow. Once we have these features, we can now train a machine learning model. Uh, and the training is based on using, uh, again, uh, a feed forward network, um, you know, or you can also use convolutional neural networks. But there could be various kinds of models that could be trained. Um, and then the output would be uh, that we have a classification of the faults in the P. But we have a problem here. The problem is that because it's machine learning, the accuracy is not always 100%. Uh, sometimes a fault that is benign is, is uh, classified wrongly as being critical. Um, or with what is worse is that a fault is actually critical, but is classified as being benign. So this is a, a, a escape, right? So we can be a bit pessimistic, and we can sometimes uh, predict a benign fault as being critical. The impact is, is going to be that the, the, the cost of doing the testing would go up. But the, the opposite is, is worse, right? If a fault is critical, but we classify that as benign, then we do not test that fault. It may cause a failure in the field. So uh, what do we do here? Well, we are going to use one more machine learning model. Um, and this new machine learning model would learn to distinguish between the actual benign features and the fake features, right? The test escape are basically fake benign features. So we'd like to train a model that can distinguish be between, between the, the, these two things. And this model is based on what is called a GAN, or Generative Adversarial Network. 
So we'll train a GAN. And the GAN is basically, it will have two parts. One is a generator architecture, and one is a discriminator architecture. So we will start with some random distribution and noise. And that would be fed to the generator. And then the test escape data that we have from the previous machine learning model, that is now fed to the discriminator. So the discriminator would utilize the forward pass like this, um, and then would get trained. And then we would predict, and based on the accuracy, we would either say we are done, or we would go back to the backward pass and keep doing this once again. Okay, so the, 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 it was actually a very well-known flow of how do you uh, train a GAN. Okay, but once we train the GAN, then we can uh, basically, um, you know, actually make make use of that. So the overall flow is like this. So we have machine learning one, the first model that that I mentioned before. This is a DNN that takes uh, topological features, data features, um, ground truth data based on functional fault simulation, and it will predict certain faults to be critical, and we keep them as is in that bin, and then it would say some faults are benign. These we have to examine further because these may have some test escapes, right? So what we do is then we would use the GAN and we would do further analysis uh, and create some uh, test escape like data. And this data would be used for, for augmentation. So now we would actually use that for training machine learning too. And then machine learning too would be used to do a more fine grained categorization and identify the actual test escapes. And and with with with, with, the, with the expectation that the number of escapes would now be very very small. Okay, so once the GAN uh, it has been developed and machine learning two model has been trained, then the GAN is not needed anymore for the actual uh, uh, flow in practice. We only use machine learning model one, machine learning model two, ML one, ML two. Okay, so we have here uh, ML one that uh, is using the features that I mentioned before, uh, topological features, data features, um, and uh, and does the initial classification. It says that some faults are critical, some are benign. The ones which are um, identified as benign are examined further. So these are now fed to machine learning model two, and model two is now going to do a further categorization of these benign faults and say, are they actually benign or are they critical? So the final set we have of critical faults would be the, the sum total of the ones here and the ones there. And this is, this is what we're going to get. Okay. So it's therefore a more comprehensive flow. Uh, we don't trust machine learning model one. Uh, we know that this model can make mistakes, but we would then use the mistakes to train uh, again to create some more training data, and that is used to now train machine learning model two. And, the, and finally, we would do the classification based on a combination of machine learning model one and machine learning model two. Okay, so that is the flow. Okay, so moving forward, um, we now do some uh, evaluation. And one of the questions that comes up in evaluation is, what is the threshold we should use for, for, the, for the accuracy? At the time we did our model training, we had 95% as the accuracy, right? But 95% is actually very high, right? It's good to be pessimistic at the time you train your model, but when you use it in, in the field, you're not going to make a decision based on one image, right? If you look at autonomous driving or any other image processing application, you're taking multiple pictures, multiple frames, and the decision making is based on multiple frames and say it's K. So you're using K, K frames and you're using that to make a decision. And let's say uh, P of S is the inferencing accuracy. That is a probability that you are making the right classification for a frame. And then we have a decision threshold that basically says that at least D percent of the frames must be uh, classified correctly, okay? And D could be 80%, could be 70%, and so on. So the probability that you are making the right decision or PM is that at least 80% of the K frames are correctly classified. And that you can express like this, okay? So K, it's basically uh, choose I out of K, and then K, and then I is from this to that, okay? So this is the, the actual... Uh, the, the accuracy, 
Okay, so you can now do a plot of this. If, if I plot um, PM, which is the probability that I'm making the, the right decision versus the accuracy threshold, I get curves like this for different values of K and D. So I'm varying K from 70 to 150, 70 frames per second to 150 frames per second, and the D, the threshold for accuracy classification is 50% or 70%. And, and these are what are what are used in practice for, for example, for self-driving cars. Um, and you can see that if I set my PS to be 0.8, then I can sort of guarantee that my PM is one, okay? I do not make any mistake. So, so we can therefore um, set a slightly more relaxed threshold for the catastrophically critical fault. And we say that if the accuracy for a single image is 80% or more, then the uh, probability that I'll make the right decision is very high. Okay. So we use this next, and we look at uh, the accuracy of fault classification for the PEs. So we're looking first at the 22-bit adder in a 128 by 128 um, uh, solid array. And we just take a single PE here. Uh, this is 20th row and to row 20 and column zero. Um, so this is, we are doing multiple experiments. So there are five runs being done. So we do five, you know, this is a cross validation. We'll be training with five, uh, you know, ways of partitioning the data into training data and validation data. Uh, this is the accuracy percentage in terms of whether I'm able to uh, bin the fault in the most accurate manner. Um, and then this is the result you get after machine learning model one. So there are 26 critical nodes. A node has multiple faults, as you know, it can be a, a, a stuck at one or stuck at zero, but we're looking at nodes first. So for example, if I'm looking at uh, the first experiment out of the 26 nodes that were critical, uh, two were misclassified as benign. So we then apply machine learning two, uh, and now we can bring it down to one. And then for the fifth experiment, it's actually zero, all right? And the last column talks about um, how many of the faults, not nodes, are misclassified. And the number is either one or zero here, right? So that's actually, actually is pretty good. Uh, and then we look in the same way at the multiplier. And for the multiplier uh, in the same PE, um, we again have uh, five experiments based on different ways of doing the cross validation. We are partitioning the training data and the validation data in five, five ways. Um, again, the accuracy numbers here, um, which is actually high, but I think we are more interested in the escapes, right? We don't want to miss any critical fault. So after doing machine learning one, we have a problem because we have a fairly large number of nodes that are misclassified. Uh, this number is brought down by using machine learning model two. And if you look at the actual number of faults uh, that are critical, but are misclassified, it's either one or zero. Uh, one interesting comment I would like to make here is that uh, there is a trade-off between ML1 and ML2. If ML1 does very well, then it is very hard to train the GAN, and therefore ML2 is not all that uh, effective, so that you won't get much of an advantage in using ML2. But if ML1 does badly, that is, it has large escapes, um, there is more data that is now uh, uh, available for training the GAN. And as a result, you can have a much more powerful ML2. And the overall combination is actually quite good. So this is a very interesting problem that we're looking at. Like, what is the right mix? Um, do we want to have a very good ML1 um, and then not so good ML2? Or we would like to have an average not so good ML1 and then use that to make a very strong uh, ML2? Uh, this is looking at a 16-bit PE, which includes both the adder and the multiplier. Uh, now, the accuracy here is actually low. You can see it's not as high, so which means that many uh, benign faults are being misclassified. But, but that's okay. I mean, it's just a pessimistic way of doing it. But what really helps here is that after ML1, you have a large fraction of uh, test escapes. But after ML2, it's down to zero. Okay, so this is an example where ML1, ML1 was not very effective. It did okay, but not great. But then we got a lot of information to train the GAN and then to train ML2, and then the combination worked really, really well. And we have no t -t test escape whatsoever. Okay, 
Uh, then we look at finally a transferability, right? Because all this was for a single PE. We, we trained the model on one PE and we ap applied it to the same PE. Now the question is, can I train on one PE and then can I, can I use the model for some other PEs? So this was an experiment where we trained this on this given PE, 20 comma zero, and then we applied this model for looking at criticality assessment for 45 comma zero, 45 comma eight, and so on. So four PEs uh, uh, in some other uh, columns and rows. Uh, and again, here you will find that after we go through ML1, ML2, we go through the entire uh, flow, we find that there are there is only a small number of faults which are mis classified the test escapes which we get is one percent 1.5 percent or even less okay so it looks actually very good and and it's it looks good because we did not do anything explicit to transfer the model okay this was all implicit right we just trained on a given p and then we just closed our eyes and applied that trained model to some other p so we are fairly optimistic that we can make this escape percentage close to zero if we can do the transfer in a more intelligent manner OK, Okay. so uh, this is looking at the multiplier again. And here, uh, it's even much better. So in the three of the PEs, our uh, escape is 0 after the transfer. And in one, it's about it's uh, it's 2.6%. Uh, for the 16-bit PE, it works perfectly. So even though we are doing no uh, special um, transferability, uh, but even then, we are getting 0 escapes when we use the train model on, 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 on these other P's. OK, so this is the final slide. I hope I am on time. Um, the final slide basically gives you a summary. So uh, we have shown that most of the faults, uh, pin level faults, in 16-bit and 32-bit P's are benign. It's over 93%. Okay, In fact, all the pins in multiple input buses A and B are benign. Uh, most of the Mentissa pins in all the buses are benign. And the critical faults are usually localized to the sign and exponent bits of the accumulation bus and the multiplier output. Also, we showed that pin level faults are very highly correlated ac across PEs. Um, and we were able to show using some correlation analysis that the benign fault um, in a pin of a given P is likely to stay benign in some other PE. Uh, I then showed you a two-tier machine learning method, which is very effective to evaluate the criticality of faults inside a PE. We look at two, looked at two kinds of features, uh, topology features and features based on data flow. Uh, these are good representations of the internal connectivity and the flow of information through the array. And then we also looked at a GAN-based method that can be used to create more test escape like data to create uh, to train machine learning too and it appears based on our, uh, our results so far that this approach is is transferable so th thanks a lot and that is the end of my talk i'll stop uh, sh sh sharing now and uh, let me see if i can get out of here Okay. 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 Now it's okay. Thank you very much for your enlightening speech, Professor Chakrabarty. So we have some questions. I will just start from one question by myself. Um, uh, with respect of the performance, if you need real time response, uh, have you an idea how many frames per second you can process, for instance? So we have, not, yes, so th I think this is a very good question. So we have not done an, a real-time experiment. We didn't take this and use it for uh, actual classification of moving images, but we have we are working with some uh, companies which are looking at uh, autonomous driving, and they are looking at a number like 70 or 80. So if they are looking at less than 70, they don't have uh, that much confidence in uh, in the in the in, in, in the accuracy of what they predict. If it is more than 150 or so, then there is too much of n n noise in the information, right? So there's a trade-off between how much noise you get in the data versus if you have enough to 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 make an accurate prediction. Okay, thank you. So I have some questions on uh, our chat here. So uh, Rodrigo as uh, Jose Azambuja ask. How does your model scale to bigger or more complex circuits? 
Okay, so this is an excellent question. I, I will answer this in two ways. One is the processing element itself will not become much bigger. That's the whole idea of, of doing it this way, having an array, solid arrays that you have very simple PEs. So the PE is going to be a few thousand gates, not very big. But the array can be made bigger, right? So 128 by 128 or 256 by 256, and maybe even bigger. So right now, the largest arrays that you can get in the market is uh, 256 by 256. Okay, this is the biggest, but it could get bigger. Uh, and this is the precise reason why we are looking at a method like this, because one of the baseline methods would be you could do fault injection everywhere, right? You could uh, enumerate all the faults. You could run functional simulation using the input data. And then you could say, is the fault benign or not? But if you do it this way, you have thousands of inputs, thousands of images, for example, maybe more, and you have uh, billions of faults. Uh, and running it through a functional simulation flow would take you years, right? Would take you years. So therefore, um, a brute force method will not scale. Now, what we did is we took one PE, which is fairly small, and we extracted some uh, ground truth data for that PE, which requires exhaustive fault simulation. But it's, again, a small block, small PE. Uh, and then we trained a model which could be used for every other PE in the design. So this flow, it does not, uh, it does not take any more time if the PE, if the, if the uh, array becomes larger, right? Because you only have to work on one PE in, in, in the array. So the scalability is, is actually, actually very good. Um, in terms of applying this met methodology to a larger array. The challenge or uh, the open problem is, does the transferability work all the time? Because there, our, our findings are empirical, right? We, we took a, a particular example, a particular deep neural network. Um, we showed that after being trained on one PE, it can be applied to four other PEs. But this is a very, very small example, right? There are thousands of PEs we, we should try. So what we are doing now is we're trying to come up with some theory that basically looks at, can we transfer the models? So uh, in, in machine learning, you have things like domain adaptation. So if you train a model in a certain domain and the environment changes, so maybe the data flow will change, uh, will the model work there as well? So we can do transfer. Now, the good thing is that the PEs are identical, right? So the the topological features are the same. If I train on PE1 and I'm trying to use it for PE number 10, it's the same adder, the same multiplier, the same net list, right? But what is different is the input data that this PE gets. That will change, right? So, so therefore, we need to think about a heterogeneous adaptation method where we transfer some features unchanged, right? But there are other features which 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 which, which, which have to be uh, modified to account for uh, where the PE is inside the array. Okay, thank you. There are some other questions. Uh, Stephen Rodriguez asked uh, regarding the first part of the talk: Was the pin fault injection on the behavioral model only considered the PEs and interconnections? So that's and another question. What about the other modules in the AI? That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah. So we were looking only at the at the PEs and interconnections, right? So if you are talking about you have a microcontroller, you have memories, you have external units. So we didn't look, we didn't look at them. The main reason why we didn't do we didn't do that is um, number one, those faults have a much larger impact on the overall accuracy. So the criticality is much more for those faults. Number two, if you look at the area of one of some of these accelerator chips, most of the area is the PE, PE array. That takes up most of the actual area. So the percentage of faults that are due to the PE is going to be much, much more, right? Yeah, so it could be an interesting exercise. So we could say, OK, let us inject faults everywhere, even though everywhere is a small part of the PE array. Um, but my expectation is that there's going to be a very high fault criticality there. Okay. So uh, finally, another question by Juan David. 
Uh, do you think that the proposed approach to eval evaluate the PEs in systolic arrays in AI acceleration can be adapted to other AI ac architectures such as GPUs? Ah, this is an interesting question, and this is probably not so easy to answer, right? So GPUs are very complex blocks, right? So if you look at an uh, uh, accelerator with multiple G GPUs, I'm pretty sure this approach will not work because um, the data flow is much more complex, right? Uh, there's a lot of control data as well. But if you look at inside the GPU, the internal is, is, is also an array. And it's also a tile of multiple identical elements. So it is quite feasible that you could apply a similar strategy to look at fault criticality for the modules inside the GPU, right? Um, we, we have not really done that because um, number one, it's hard to really get benchmarks. So it, most of the GPUs, the insides are proprietary. So you have to find a way to let NVIDIA tell you um, what is inside the GPU, right? So that is a challenge. And 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 also, um, you know, the data flow inside the GPU is a bit more complex. So, you know, you have to know CUDA, you have to th think about protocols, uh, they have a network on chip as well. So um, while I think that the approach can be translated to that environment, but I think it's not so easy to do that. Okay, uh, so there is no more questions. So I thank you again for your excellent talk. It was very, very enlightening for our uh, workshops. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.